There's a deep cut song from the 1980s by the Athens, Georgia band R.E.M. long before their Losing My Religion success, of course. It's called Koyahoya. It's about the river of the same name in Northern Ohio. It's deceptively simple, but in words like the ones I'm about to read, it was actually about the land and the people that white Europeans displaced in order to settle there. Let's put our heads together and start a new country up. Our father's father's father tried, erase the parts he didn't like. Let's try to fill it in. This is where they walked. This is where they swam. Take a picture here. Take a souvenir. That may be a dark way to honor Father's Day, I admit. But I guess with civil liberties on the table politically these days, and the 4th of July marching just around the corner, and a Juneteenth this past Friday like no other before it, my heart these days is heavy with the notion of this land, the peoples trampled on and enslaved and locked out, so that white Europeans might flourish and start their own new world. I'm sure some of you are fatigued by these thoughts and discussions over the last few weeks as race relations seem to have boiled over. It's a packed month in our country, as well as our world, from the death of George Floyd to the refreshed anger and injustice over the death of Breonna Taylor in Louisville, Kentucky. Only one white officer has been fired, none even charged with a crime of the most blatant use of excessive force on an innocent unarmed woman I can recall. And then the fallout in Atlanta from the death of Rayshard Brooks at the hands of police and the resignation of the city's chief of police. Then of course, a slew of white people who are trying our best to listen and learn. We're gobbling up books like How to Be an Anti-Racist and White Fragility in a respectable attempt to confront our inaction and silence on the matter. It's always about this time, just like a mass shooting or other terrible event in our nation, perhaps even COVID-19, when Americans generally become malaised and say, we're kind of tired of hearing about all this. Can we please change the subject? Talk about the weather or yard work or what you saw on Netflix or so on. But no one said this was going to be easy. We can't make racism up and disappear. In the face of this, we are confronted with a story from Matthew's Gospel that comes right at the time when we are waning in interest of confronting the difficult aspects of our lives and other people's lives. This is too hard. Jesus here is powerful and defiant in his rhetorical question. Do you think I have come here to bring peace on earth? It's a total upending of the Christmas notion of the Christ child promising peace on earth, goodwill towards men. In a fiery reversal, Jesus now says, I did not come to bring peace, but the sword. You can imagine how many Christians over the centuries have taken this phrase out of its context to justify their ambitions in tackling enemies. Wars have started because of these potentially volatile words. People have been killed and nations have fallen because of them. The type of world Jesus seems to describe here with family members against family members evokes for me one of the worst and necessary chapters in our history, the Civil War. Christians, for scores of years by that point, had used the parts of the Bible they definitely liked best to justify their desire to lift the sword with whomever crossed them and to enslave African Americans because pieces of the Bible reference slavery and the notion of slaves being servant to their masters. But Jesus is also the one who in the same exact gospel, just a few chapters later, says, all who live by the sword will perish by the sword. So what's happening here? Well, first, in its context, Jesus is already speaking to the Abba, the Father, the potter, who molds us like clay, a notion hearkening back to the Old Testament. That same God has a history of erasing the slate to start over when the human project has failed, be it flood or by fire, culminating, however, in a new and final attempt to reconcile us 
becoming incarnate in Jesus, his son. Jesus' mere presence, his teachings, his miracles, his attitude, his preaching, brings the sword upon him. It threatens the status quo, the way the world had corrupted into, not the way the world was supposed to be. The sword is part of the story, just as peace is part of the story. And it may be a means to the end, but it didn't mean Jesus lifted a finger himself to instigate it. He attracted division, ironically, in his attempt to heal us all. And in the Civil War, as Juneteenth reminded us this past Friday, the point of the sword was less Southern states' rights, as is often taught exclusively in schools and history books, and more about the injustice of keeping man, woman, and child in bondage. It would sadly take the sword to begin that healing. And as this past month has reminded us and God willing has taught us all, we are far off from fully realizing that healing. Back in 1862, Abraham Lincoln, we were taught in American history, was adamantly opposed to slavery and that drove his resilience in seeking to squash the South and reunite the nation. But the ones who settled the stolen lands and tilled the fields with slave labor wrote the history books, as I alluded to two weeks ago. For example, I'm currently reading a book called The People's History of the United States, and although not written by a person of color, it does, however, seek to demythologize the white man's persistent, heroic role in establishing the United States of America. I'm also reminded of a great miniseries from PBS, God and America, which spoke of Lincoln's deep and wounded struggle with God. It turns out that Lincoln was not, in fact, all opposed to slavery when he became president. And instead, he wrestled with it. And then in 1862, Lincoln and Mary Todd's son, Willie, died suddenly. And it drove her insane and drove Lincoln into a depression. All in the midst of the war, which was at that point in the South's favor. Famously, he wrote, I have been driven many times upon my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. Lincoln must have been ambitious, had dreams of at least two full terms of office and all the legislation he would help pass, but no one said it was going to be easy and he ended up having the worst go of it in the White House and in his family life. He plunged the depths of his grief and sorrow and outwardly processed. And as we learn later from his writings and journaling, he found that God was leading him into new pathways, new awakenings, new understandings, through a faith that was a piece of clay broken and then reheated and melted and pierced back together into something new. Lincoln came out of his depression understanding better, but not perfectly, that the black person in America was entitled to freedom and justice. As he worked on the Emancipation Proclamation, he also shook up his approach to the war and the road ahead, and it culminated in the North's victory two and a half years later. Yet weeks after his death, news that the Emancipation Proclamation had been passed finally reached the furthest reach of the Union, Galveston, Texas, on June 19th, 1865, Juneteenth. But none of that is the story that we were taught when we were kids, was it? It is a parallel to the kind of Bible stories we think we need to hear. The lilies of the field, the good Samaritan, the little children on Jesus's lap. Today's gospel reminds us that there are the stories we tell ourselves and the stories we need to be told. Another president, Thomas Jefferson, famously cut out the parts of his Bible that he didn't like real mature faith, real appreciation for all God has to offer, takes into account the passages we love and the passages we don't want to hear, but have to. 
and so it goes for the world today. We all want a daily boost, but there are the plight of others that keep calling us to look and absorb, and we have to contend with those too. The phrase, an inconvenient truth, comes to mind. Where do we go from here? We're in the fourth week of racial tension and protests in favor of Black Lives Matter. We, the white members of civilization who, through no fault of our own, benefit from the privilege of being white, as has been our inheritance for generations, all the way back to the settlers on the Potomac, the James, the Mississippi, and the Cuyahoga. Just because it wasn't our fault doesn't mean we aren't capable of doing something, just as Lincoln did. We are all learning and yet looking for what tangible things we can do, what might we be able to do to repair the brokenness. I saw a great example of that humility this week coming through slicing the division and the same old, same old, like, well, a sword. Minnesota Senator Amy Klobuchar, who came up short in a Democratic presidential nomination a few months ago, was now poised as one of the top three or four possible choices for vice president on the ticket this election year. However, Senator Klobuchar, who probably saw the marches, the protests, perhaps she saw the companies who took away their racist mascots, or the owners of organizations who apologized finally. Perhaps she heard the cries of people of color to be given their chance, their shot for a change. Perhaps she was just motivated politically, and that's fair too. Regardless, she did a great and difficult thing this week. She took herself out of the running for vice president, saying, After uh, what I've seen in my state, what I've seen across the country, uh, this is a historic moment, and America must seize on this moment. And I truly believe, uh, as I actually told the vice president last night uh, when I called him, uh, that I think this is a moment uh, to put a woman of color on that ticket. And there are so many incredibly qualified women. Um, but if you want to heal this nation right now, my party, yes, but our nation, uh, this is sure a hell of a way to do it. The pain and sadness in her voice, to me, is unmistakable. No one said sacrifice was easy, but that is what we are called to do. Jesus calls us to be his followers, his disciples, to take up our cross and be like him, lose ourselves in him, in fact. And it, of course, has implications in how we behave, how we breathe in this world around us. But no one said it was going to be easy.